Hi, so my name is Michelle Burkett, um, and I'm an associate professor in the Department of Medical Social Sciences and the Department of PrevMed at um, Northwestern University in the Feinberg School of Medicine. And today I'm going to summarize some of the conversations which occurred during an event that my group organized a few years ago called the Bias and Big Data Workshop. Um, this was a workshop which attempted to create a unique space where data scientists and those concerned about data science could come together and discuss what they see as issues that are percolating in this new area of data science and how these issues might be resolved. Um, so the point of this event was really to bring people together who had um, a lot of different perspectives because oftentimes we're, we're kind of isolated from each other. So it, it focused on bringing together data scientists and public health workers and community members and funders to have a space to grapple with some of these issues that we see around big data and data science and to highlight some of the work of folks that is already being done in the space, some, some of the good work that's already happening. Um, our keynote address was by Yeshi Milner um, from Data for Black Lives, um, and it was a really um, uh, energizing and successful event. Um, we, from that event, we, we pulled together a white paper called the Bison Big Data 2019 Workshop White Paper. Um, it's available here at this address. Um, and what we pulled together in that paper is that there are six themes that emerged. Um, and I want to talk a little bit more about one of the themes um, that uh, I, I think we can probably best talk about maybe through a, a little bit of an activity. Um, so the theme is um, that bias is inherent. Um, that's, that's sort of the first thing that sort of comes out of our conversations and our work. And what that means, um, you know, it's sort of this idea that, you know, data science is plagued with this idea of bias. Um, and it is oftentimes what's frequently talked about when we start talking about um, bias in data science is this idea that when there's automated decision making and when there are prediction systems about um, who is um, most likely to be impacted by what, Oftentimes, these things are really plagued by bias. Um, it, but what bias in, is inherent means is that it's not just um, an algorithm. It is not just a single um, prediction system that is the problem. It is that bias is inherent throughout the entire research process. It isn't just a poorly constructed algorithm. It is every step along the way. And what we're talking about here is not just prejudices held consciously or unconsciously by individuals, but it's also the systemic inequities that are present in the existing world that have been shaped by both present and historical hierarchies of power. So to help demonstrate this, I want to walk you through an activity. Um, it's just a little thought experiment where we're going to identify how bias impacts each step of the research process. So first, let's get on the same page about what the research process is, okay? So I have a little circle on, on the page right now, and you see a bunch of people. So maybe, you know, step zero, the world exists and um, is ready to be observed. And then someone is an observer of that world. I have a little stick person here in the middle. And then that observer is going to look at the world and they're going to identify some sort of problem that they want to ask a question about. And after they observe that problem, the next step is to abstract that problem down into a model and to formalize it in some way, to transform a complex problem into something that is testable and tangible. And this is the part that folks usually think of as research. It's the part with the numbers and the data and the analysis, and it's the part that can scare a lot of data first people away. After that, hopefully, we build a model and it runs, and then we receive some sort of results that we're able to interpret to find a solution to our original problem. And then we apply that solution, hopefully back into the world, and make everything better. 
Now, I want to go back through this process we just outlined, and I want to talk through where bias might enter into each of these steps. So first, we need to talk about who makes it to the privileged position of getting to be a researcher. Um, we know that there's a lot of inequity here. Um, the AI Now Institute reports that 80% of AI professors are men, um, that women only comprise 15% of AI research staff at Facebook and 10% at Google. There's no data on trans individuals and gender minorities, and that 2.5% of Google's workforce is black. Um, now, you know, who is able to become a researcher is also linked to what questions get asked and what is deemed worthy to study. Whose problems are you trying to solve? Often the purpose of the system is to become more efficient. Um, you're, you're doing, um, you're trying to solve problems in order to make things maybe a little bit more efficient, to save people money but not necessarily always to be giving help to the most needy, people who might have less uh, of a voice in that system. An important part of understanding, you know, the, who is able to ask these questions is, is asking the question, whose problem am I solving here? Whose observations are deemed worthy and who is able to define what is problematic? Another part of this too is that research is expensive and who has the resources to carry this question into an actual research study? This is one of the places where funders are so important in driving and in sort of creating opportunities for individuals to ask questions where institutions can provide infrastructure to allow questions to be asked that maybe wouldn't be asked otherwise. What kinds of problems are seen as needing to be solved with technology versus with people? Because technological solutions are often, they're cheap, they're scalable, and the kinds of problems that are solved with technology versus humans are different because it's often cheap to, to use technology. Folks um, who are seen as least important are the ones who are often interfacing with these systems in the name of efficiency. So this is talked a lot about in the book Automating Inequality by Virginia Eubanks. She talks about how some people are treated with agency and with expertise, and some people are treated as objects that are meant to be diverted and sorted. And you can see this um, in her example and in, in her book as she talks um, extensively about Medicaid systems and how they're, they're not meant to create interfaces for individuals to interact with other people. Instead, oftentimes they're navigating bureaucratic systems. Now, moving on, the next step is to then create a mathematical model of the problem. And innate in this, some hypotheses are embedded in how a question gets constructed. And also embedded in this are some key decision points about specifically what data is used to answer a question, what analytic methods are gonna be the best, provide the best solution for you. And the researcher now has the ability to choose from a lot of different options here in terms of what are the constructs? So what are the outcomes of interest? Who are we studying? What are the data sets? Um, when it comes to data sets, oftentimes the data sets might not contain exactly what you want, and so you might be making decisions as a researcher about proxy data that you will utilize to get at what you're interested in. And that data itself could be biased because taking data from the real world, we know the real world is always biased. And if you don't have an understanding of the ways in which it might be biased, you might be building into your tool, into your problem, into your research study, um, biases that you don't even know exist. The choice of analytic method here is also important. So one thing that I notice oftentimes is that, you know, if, if, if you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. If you know how to, oftentimes these um, methods are so complicated. And if you know, if, if you have a lot of expertise in one area, you might think that this is always going to be 
the right thing to use for every problem, but not necessarily. Um, each method, uh, methodology, has strengths and weaknesses associated with it. And often folks use the method, the one that they know best how to use, or the one that is most exciting, potentially, versus what might be best for understanding their problem. And another part of this, too, is that some methods are a little more, I like to say, dense. They are a little bit um, more complicated for external individuals to come in and to evaluate when you have a lot of complexity um, potentially, um, you know, I'm thinking about some very complicated modeling problems or um, automated machine learning sorts of things where it's really hard to understand what's driving um, some of the findings. Um, it can be a little bit harder to understand if there is bias baked into it. And then step three in the research process we receive results, hopefully. One thing to consider here is, when do we know that we're done? When do we know that we've gotten a, an appropriate result? Um, and when do we go back to the drawing board? How do we validate our work? Are we thinking about, um, you know, especially when you have automated approaches, validation is really key because, you know, you sort of you know, have a set of data and you're fitting to it, and it's always important that you're able to validate it externally in some real world scenario. Otherwise, uh, it's going to be a little difficult to determine how, what did you do? You know, how, how accurate is this and how accurate this is to the real world context that you want to utilize it for. Um, you know, one thing, you know, that has um, been brought up many times over the years is, um, you know, there's 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 a lot of issues sometimes when these um, these systems become um, decontextualized um, from the external world that's surrounding them. So one one example that comes up quite often is um, <laughs> Google flu. So there was an initial Google paper, and it stated that Google flu trends predictions were 97 percent accurate comparing to CDC data. But one of the things that happened is that that changed over time, and it changed substantially. So uh, Google results on, on you know, flu, the, the search term flu, was no longer predictive. And if we rely too much on any one system, especially one that is very um, decontextualized, removed from the context of where the problems actually arise, we always risk that they will fail in the future because the world changes, everything changes. Um, and we need to have things built in that will um, be able to alert us to when this is still a good solution, this is not still a good solution. And, and to build processes in that maybe are as close to where the problems arise versus downstream indicators. And then finally, hopefully, we apply a solution. Here, things to be thinking about are, are folks from the real world, are the are invested parties, are they allowed to be part of the interpretation of those results, the implementation of that solution? Um, there's been a lot of writing about this too. Um, Virginia Eubanks and both Kathy O'Neill, they both talk about how data systems, they allow emotional distance from real people. And oftentimes, what they um, perpetuate is unrealistic solutions, unethical solutions. It removes the ability for individuals to engage the people who are decision makers. It, it, it removes the um, ability of those folks to advocate for themselves, to explain their ideas. And there is power in human-to-human -human communication. You can't explain yourself to automated systems. A lot of these systems aren't built um, for the folks who are on the margins, and um, it is important that you know folks are thinking about how to bring the actual impacted individuals into these solutions, both to give feedback on them and to make sure they're implemented correctly. 
We're at the end of the activity, but one thing I want to say is that none of this is new. These are things that have always been here whenever we're talking about research and science and none of this is new. The difference here is that in data science and big data, biases can be amplified at scale and it can be more easily hidden. It's so complicated sometimes to dive into um, the specifics of how these systems are built, the decision points along the way, the, um, all of the individuals who've gone into making decisions about how data is shaped, how methods were chosen. It's very difficult. Oftentimes there's not one individual who's accountable for everything. All of these things, they make this so much harder and we need to be even more vigilant when it comes to these um, approaches that are so large in scale. We need to be even more vigilant here in remembering that at each stage there can still be bias as a part of this.